Good morning, everyone. How are you? <laughs> okay, y'all got to give me more energy than that. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so very much for coming to today's workshop presentation, conversation. Um, I love it when we do these breakout sessions um, because it is definitely a more intimate setting. So I want you to feel free to write down some questions because at the end we will be doing a Q&A. This is going to be really some true honest dialogue. Um, we're not going to be pulling back any punches um, because when it comes to breaking barriers, when it comes to building empires, it is not for the faint of heart. And a lot of times social media would lead us to believe that you go to bed a blunder and wake up a wonder. And I don't know about you, but it didn't happen for me that way. <laughs> there was some blood, sweat, tears, and sacrifice that went behind it. And so you're going to hear stories and anecdotes and experiences and great knowledge and wisdom from our two experts here in regards to the challenges that they have overcome. Um, again, welcome to Breaking Barriers and Building Empires. I'm going to allow my speakers to take about 30 seconds, 60 seconds to introduce themselves. I know you can click on the little QR code and get more information, but let's go ahead and read it. Good morning. Good morning. I hope most of you are sufficiently caffeinated. If not, don't worry, we'll have a good time. So my name is Brittany Hale, and I'm not going to go through my whole bio, but here's what you need to know. I've been very fortunate over the past few years to manage a portfolio of engagements that have included interim executive work. I pivoted from a career as an undefeated trial attorney into business strategy. So I've served as an interim executive. I provided leadership development. And currently, I'm focused on developing strategy for women who are either in leadership or aspiring to leadership to help them de to develop the clarity that they need to lead with confidence. So I'm excited to connect with you here today. And I hope we can provide some value to you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marian Pagano. I am Chief Executive Officer of Blackhawk Data. We are an IT solutions provider in the New York metro area. We're in business. We just hit six years in June. Um, I spent my whole life in the IT channel. So I was an inside sales rep. I supported account managers for probably 20 years until my partner, Jason, convinced me to quit my job and start a business back in June of 2018. Uh, we're currently at about 50 employees, and we're looking to hit the $100 million mark this year. So that's my story. I am Krishna Powell. I'm the CEO of HR for Your Small Biz. I am fondly referred to as the multi-gen leader. I literally travel the world showing leaders and organizations how to manage a multi-generational, multicultural workforce. So that is who I am. So, thank you. Let's get started. So when we, when we think about overcoming and breaking barriers and building empires, let's, let's first talk about the barriers. You know, we'll, we'll celebrate the sunshine later on, but let, let's talk about some of the rainy days. So breaking barriers, when you think about the barriers that you have overcome in your life, the challenges, what has been some of the hardest things or one of the hardest things you've had to overcome? And what were the steps that you took to come out on the other side? So I'll start with you, Brittany. Yeah. So I, again, I started as an attorney, as a black woman. I'm one of 2% of attorneys in the United States uh, who look like myself. So you can imagine when I was in a Jersey courtroom, uh, there were few people who looked like me. And one morning I was at trial call and actually I had two adversaries. And so I was preparing to go to trial. We're in a courtroom of about 40 attorneys. And uh, my adversaries are speaking to a colleague and they said, oh, where's your adversary? They pointed at me and said, oh, you've got a great looking adversary. To which they replied, yeah, we're only trying the case because we wanna look at her. So then you, ha correct. Mm -hmm. So then you have about 35 other men turning around to evaluate 
you know, whether or not that statement was true. So that is an example of what we would call uh, what's commonly referenced as the tall poppy syndrome. Have you heard of the tall poppy syndrome? You may not have heard of it, but I guarantee you've experienced it. So if you are an ambitious woman, if you are a high achieving woman, uh, you've experienced what's called the tall poppy syndrome. So researchers have polled women across 103 countries. And what they found is that these women who are high achieving have experienced what's called the tall poppy syndrome, meaning that they are uh, systemically excluded within the workplace as an effort to cut them down. So what does that exclusion look like? That exclusion looks like uh, not being invited to outings where you can interface with, with partners. Some people are nodding because they've experienced it. That looks like other people taking credit for your work. That looks like uh, supervisors telling you you're a bit too much. Could you just tone it down a bit? That looks like uh, being the last person, you know, being left off of emails for you to only discover in meetings that you see people are not, you've experienced it, right? We seem to have a lot of tall poppies in the room. And so this is not just about likability. This is not just about uh, a popularity contest. This is about impacting the bottom line because what we see is across 103 countries, over 75% of these women, thousands of women who've been polled, have found that it impacts their productivity by 75%. So you have, at least in this country, you have 47% of the workforce that is being isolated and not having their potential and their talent leveraged. And so that is why I started B&D Consulting. B&D is not my initials. It stands for Be Nobody's Darling because that's my challenge, okay? That's my challenge uh, to attract the tall poppies who want to stand tall and not have to apologize for it. Excellent. <laughs> so obviously building a business and continuing to right you, there are barriers constantly in your way uh for us the very first barrier was i guess two days after i quit my job um i got served with a federal affidavit ended up in federal court for a few months um so we spent all our money on federal court and, and i think what happens is i remember being told that you know we gave you your career we made you who you are um, you know, you kind of owe us, right? You can't leave the family. You can't do certain things. And I think that being in such a, you know, a male dominated industry is really super hard because you have to carve and pave your own way. Um, and that was the hardest part for me. I'm still a female. Rather, you know, I may be kind of tough on the outside a little bit. <laughs> Jason may disagree. Um, <laughs> but it's still a barrier, right? Because you still have to get past that. And then that sticks with you for a while. Like, you know, when people Google your name for the first six months or eight months, that's all that comes up. And, you know, you get questioned a lot about it. So it's being able to push that down and kind of get past that because I think that was a unexpected thing for me. Like I knew I'd be really tough to leave, but that was probably super unexpected for me. So it was a lot of time and energy put in and a lot of time to get rid of that when you see my name. So that was my largest barrier. Thank you. Let me ask you this, Marianne, and the question will come to you afterwards, Brittany. Being in such strong male-dominated industries, especially at the beginning of your career, how did you find your voice sitting at that table? Because a lot of times, as Brittany mentioned, they, they like to look at you, but they don't necessarily want to hear from you. They will ask you to go get coffee and tea and et cetera. So how did you find your voice? What are some of the things that you did in order to be seen and heard and taken seriously? So I think one of the things I tell people is when you build your brand, you build your network. But I think the, hard, the, the, the hardest thing to do is find those people that you trust, right? Going through what I went through. You know, the Blackhawk 11, people's like, oh, could you find your right domain? But the 11 stands for the 11 people within my network, my core people, my trust factors mm -hmm. that I can trust that had my back during like super hard times. And I think that you have to find those people in the room, in your organization, in your network, right? We have an IT channel. So finding people that can support you through that to get you through that and have your back because they'll help you give that, give you the support you need. And when you walk into a room and there's 20 people and you're the only female and you can see that person looking across from you and you feel, you feel comforted that I know that person, they've got my back and it makes you feel better and stronger when you walk into a room. 
Yeah, I think that's completely right. You know, I have always been very, very curious. Uh, and so when you're looking to distinguish yourself, many of us have what I like to call the Don Draper effect, right? Is you want to adopt the, the personalities of the people who are in power, right? And it's at a certain point, you're told, um, we even heard it today, right? Wear, wear different colors, don't wear patterns, all of that type of stuff. Uh, however, what a lot of women in the workforce are missing is that your authenticity is your distinct competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. And moving away from that is really the key to you not advancing, right? We, we immediately say, okay, well, you know, Bob golf, so I'm gonna golf, right? I need to go golfing. Um, however, sometimes those opportunities are not afforded to us. So we have to get creative and we have to lean into our authenticity to figure out what that looks like. So practically speaking, if you're in a meeting you probably have questions. And if you're in a Zoom room, I understand that feeling when your stomach drops because you take yourself off of mute. You're like, oh, okay, quick question here. Um, and I would say, please don't discount yourself by saying, this is probably a dumb question, but it's not. It's not, you don't have to qualify your existence and your belonging in that space because very often your question may shine light on the dark corners that everyone's either overlooking or assuming. And it's those opportunities to lean into that curiosity that I have found have been super helpful as I've uh, advanced because that's your way to build rapport with the stakeholders. That's your way to build relationships with people. Uh, if you happen to be someone who's curious or as my parents would say, very nosy, uh, like myself, that's your opportunity to lean in and distinguish yourself for the talent that obviously got you there in the first place. Thank you. And that's a really great point. I remember for myself being in corporate America and was told that, Krishna, you're, you're always wearing colors. Can't you just stick to the traditional black and dark blue? Because I was in the financial services industry. And initially in the beginning of my career, I did try to conform. But as these ladies have shared with you, I felt like I was being choked to death. And I was like, this isn't me. So I had to have the courage to sit down and talk to the leader and tell her, thank you very much for your input, but color is who I am. Even when she told me, well, do you, do you have to wear your hair in braids? That's, I don't view that as professional. I've made the choice that yes, I'm going to wear my hair in braids because I like the way I look in braids and I want my daughters to feel proud of their natural hair. So I'm going to be the example for them. And so sometimes it's just having the courage to have that conversation and also be okay with the fact when I had that conversation, I made up in my mind that I was okay with the fact that if they decided not to promote me because I did not fit their cookie cutter image, that that was going to be okay because it was going to be their loss. Because as Brittany said, your authenticity, the very thing that makes you who you are is what is needed in the workplace. I've spent 30 years in human resources. I hire people and look for the various. I don't want you to come in and fit in with everybody else. If that was the, that's, that's a moot point. You have the mind of the consumer. You have a different image perspective. That is what is needed, no matter what your industry is in. So that is part of your sweet spot. That is part of your genius. Don't hide that light. Don't dim it. Don't put it underneath the table for anybody. It is not serving anyone when you hide. Your voice is so needed at the table. If not, the mistakes that you see companies making, they're going to continue to make because you're not in there saying anything. It, it, it's okay if they go, oh, ouch. Yeah, sometimes we need an out. Sometimes we need a wake-up call. There is value in what they would term the negative nullies. And I remind leaders of that. They tell you, remind you, as she said, the dark places. It's time to shine a light and stop avoiding it. So with that being said, talking about the light, when you look at how you've built your empire and your business, 
what are some of the things that you were most proud of um, with your empire and what you've built? And how did you get there? How long did it take you? Because a lot of times, like I said, people think it's an overnight process. Oh, so no, it's not an overnight process. So when I started my business, I actually started my business because somebody asked me a question in a salsa class. And I, again, once myself, you know, very nosy. So they said, hey, I'm having this issue at work. And I said, oh, my gosh, you should talk to your HR department. He said, we don't have one. I said, oh, OK, that's curious. And so then I started doing some due diligence, came back and pitched their board of directors and said, hey, you have a million dollar problem. Your clients, what you're trying to achieve, you want to scale really quickly, but you don't have the infrastructure to sustain that growth. So let's figure out what we're doing. At the same time, I was practicing. I was also teaching. So I had a lot of things going on. It was in elected office. So I had to figure out what was the problem that I wanted to solve. And the immediate problem was, OK, now I need to build out this HR department. And uh, you know, again, which led to savings of about $400,000 for an organization with a $40 million budget. However, that expanded because the people who needed my help very often were women. And I understood that when I dropped into these organizations, when I decided to build leadership capacity, I recognized that there were so many people who were not receiving the support necessary. So my question to the C-suite, my question to their board of directors was, what do you want to achieve? OK? Yeah, I can grow your revenue. I, I've grown revenue for organizations by 16%. I've worked with everyone from banks to beauty startups. What do you want to accomplish? Every business is going to tell you massive growth. We want to expand our market share. So then my question is, OK, well, how are you going to do that? What does that look like for you practically? What are the systems and processes? What are the decisions that you're making every day that are going to sustain that growth? Additionally, what are you doing for half of the workforce that you have here that you're not servicing? It's great to tell everyone that you're one big family. We're like a family at work. It's great. Only to find out that it's the Manson family, OK? That's not. <laughs> at all what you're expecting. That's not what you want to do. So some of those successes has looked like um, in one quarter for a nonprofit, I grew their, uh, their budget, again, by 16%. I've grown a, but an organization's research revenue by 41%. I've, had, I've ach achieved, as interim CEO of an entrepreneurial, women-focused nonprofit, the highest levels of employee engagement in that organization's 11-year history because I've been able to utilize the skills from uh, my time as an elected official, uh, my time as an attorney. I understand the risks necessary. So it's being innovative and creative and developing those solutions. So those are some of the things that I'm most proud of. Excellent. So obviously from a six year period, you know, I think the, the first time you get over the first order, the first PO, the first time you actually feel like you've done something, I know I think we look back to the business plans that we wrote up and the and the things that we talked about, you know, six and a half, seven years ago, right? And in, in your planning phase. And you can go back and you can look at, okay, we wanted to do this, we wanted to accomplish this. It's kind of nice to kind of check that off. You know, so anyone looking to build a business, start a business, you know, writing down your thoughts and your aspirations in in a in a timeline, one year, three years, five years is, is super cool because you get to look back and see hey, this is what we said seven years ago, and this is kind of where I am today. And I think that was really important because it made us feel really good about ourselves. I think you you lose track somewhere of successes and you look, you forget about where you came from and where you, where you got to. And um, that's super helpful. I, I think for me, knowing that we are responsible for 50 people, their families, their children, you know, their livelihood, you know, that that's it's hard to to take, but you look at that and you say, hey, you know what? We gave them jobs. We gave them the ability to be who they are. And I don't want to be that employer. And we never want to be that employer that 
does what was done to us, right? We want to be the ones that are good to their people. And yes, sometimes I'm a little bit Manson. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm also a CEO. So give me a little, give me a little space. Give me a call, Marianne. We can talk. <laughs> You know, but I, I think it's important to us to make our staff happy. I mean, we did something nice for someone who's, who's been really great to us for the last six months. We sent him and his family to Florida for a couple of days. Um, so we were trying to be that different employer that gives back to their, their staff as much as possible. And for that, we get tenfold in return. And the goal was to build the business, not just for ourselves to prove that we can do it. Keeping in mind, I was sales support um, one day and then a CEO the next day. Um, so it wasn't like I had a whole lot of transition period. I had no titles in between. It was supporting an account manager, typing up quotes and you know, placing orders to being a CEO. So there's a lot of adjustments to that. But I think that, you know, when I look or and I, and I go somewhere and they know the name and now and they, I've built the brand, that is such an exciting part to know that, hey, I, I met you somewhere. Hey, I heard your name somewhere. It's like, oh, okay. So I am somebody finally. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just, Marianne, you jogged my memory when you said, you know, just kind of adjusting. One of the things that I would recommend if you're not already doing it is keeping an email draft of all of your accomplishments. I have an email draft that's been sitting in my inbox for, at this point, four years. And every time I've done something that I'm proud of myself for, I go there. Because as an entrepreneur, you have months where you're just, you're white knuckling it. You're like, I don't know if we're going to make it. Uh, but then you also have moments where you're just frustrated. You're tired. You may not give yourself the sick days. Uh, you may not give yourself the opportunity to check in with yourself because you're looking on social media and you're constantly comparing and you're just like, oh. Well, they've been in business for as long as I have. Where are they as compared to myself? Having that email draft is critical for you to understand your individual growth and to just kind of check in and say, it's okay. We're going to keep going. And I, I love that you shared that about having the email draft. A lot of times you may say, I don't, I don't even know, you know, what my accomplishments are. You know, a lot of times we as women, we want to duck and hide and go, that was no big deal. No, it was a big deal. Sometimes it's a big deal that you just woke up this morning and decided you were going to go at it again. <laughs> we take that for granted. It's not. This is, like I said, this is not for the faint of heart, being a woman, being in leadership. And sometimes that's the accomplishment. I got up and said, I'm going to do this another day that I'm going to face this again. Take that win, no matter how small. And then with your trusted circle, ask them, what are some of the things that you think I'm doing really well? What are some of the wins that you think I have had? Hear it from them and make notes of it. I, I save my thank you notes that I get from my clients for them dark and hard times. And I'm like, where's the, where's that card? Where's, where's that email? Or like she said, copy and paste it. She just gave, that's a great idea. I'm like, I need to copy and paste that into that draft and then make it easier for me when I'm on the road because it, it's not easy. And so you need to remember the value that you bring into your business, into your clients' lives, especially as you try to navigate. Many of you may be working one job and trying to do and build your business on the other. And so we have done that. Brittany, you've done it, right? So let's talk about when you're in that phase of taking that leap and saying, okay, I'm going to have this business, although I still have this other job that I need to make sure I, I, I'm su um, supplying and taking care of my family. What are some of the things that you did to make that transition easier where you said, okay, this is it? Discipline and delegation are going to be your best friend. Something as simple as, I always tell people, you know, if, if we have a great time today and you say, hey, can we meet? The first thing that I'm going to ask you, can you just send it to my calendar? I know we said Thursday at 3, but can you add it to my calendar? And that's because I have no idea where I'm going unless it's on my calendar. And I always tell people, if it's not on my calendar, I'm just going to default to my highest joy, which is probably sitting around somewhere reading my Kindle. So um, when I was full-time as an attorney, I'm teaching part-time, and I'm just starting my business. 
there are only so many hours in the day. And unfortunately, I've not been blessed to be one of those people that can operate without sleep. And what I found out in law school is that coffee doesn't work for me. It actually makes me very tired. It was, it was very depressing. So for those of you who are caffeinated, congratulations. I'm very envious. Um, but I knew that I needed an EA. That was my first hire. I always tell entrepreneurs, you need somebody else who can manage that. So again, if we put time on or if I say, oh, you know, hey, can we loop in my EA? It's not an opportunity to, to try to come off a particular way. It's a very practical function to optimize and leverage the space in your brain and the time that you have every day. Additionally, is discipline because you can only be so many places at once. Many of you, uh, maybe you're, you're part of organizations, maybe you have children, dogs and cats count. Um, maybe you're taking care of parents, maybe it's both, right? Either way, you have multiple interests, multiple priorities, all of them want to be number one. The only person that should be number one at this point in time is you, you and what you need to accomplish. And that requires discipline, that constant tug between what you want now versus what you want most. So that is what I would recommend, uh, discipline and delegation. Um, I'm sorry, I asked this question. So I've only had one job at a time. So I went from having a job to having no job and no payroll and no paycheck, right? So I'm in a different situation, right? Okay. So I quit in February. I had no pay. Well, I lost all my money, but I, I had no paycheck until probably I don't know about a year. <laughs> we lived off nothing. Um, so I don't have that same experience. I mean, for me, again, when you're this is not for the faint at heart. I think you know I, I tell people all the time it's it's doable if I can do it. Anybody can do it. Um, but definitely the, the lack of income, the lack of payroll, the really kind of living off your savings is really kind of what we did for probably about a year until we were able to take a little bit of salary at a time uh, and kind of build your salary up because I always feel like someone else needs the money more than me. So it's always me giving back to the business. So finally on year six, I think we're at a pretty good salary where I can sustain mm -hmm. and live. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm glad you brought up the topic of money. And thank you for your transparency and honesty, because a lot of times people think it's it's so easy that, you know, oh, you just went and applied for a grant or a contract or boom, you had this money and you have your business. So when you when you think about the financial piece, the load of it, what are some of the things that you did to keep your sanity and to still have that hustle to keep working the business, Marianne. So for me, what I tell people is obviously I go back to your network and your brand, right? Because for me, if I didn't have the network that I had in technology, you know, when we got our very first order, which was for uh, redevelopment of a Newark airport, Terminal A, it was awesome because we had our first PO for $5 million. And I was like, yay! It's like, oh, how am I going to buy that? Like, I don't have any money. I don't have any credit. I don't have anything. And I remember one of my friends worked at one of the distributors, and I was like, hey, Mark, I used to bust your chops and you try to sell me 10 years ago. Can you give me a $5 million credit line? Because I kind of need it. And he was like, sure. So we did. But if he hadn't done that, right, um, that would have been a challenge for me. And then, of course, as the business built, we still didn't have any money, so we had to reach out for an SBA loan. I call my friend the loan shark because he stole everything he possibly could possibly have to do that. But we had an SBA loan at first, uh, which was challenging because it's really hard to get an SBA loan. The lift to get the SBA loan was really hard. Uh, it was really time consuming. I put my house up for collateral because you needed all that done. So we finally got that and that kind of helped us through a little bit because when you talk about technology, our stuff is really pricey. So I have to be able to balance that. And then um, in the room is my, is my bankers, PNC Bank, who picked us up and then gave us the credit line we needed to to balance it because you're always balancing money forever and a day. What about you? Yeah, so I would say first, every dollar has a job. And you just, you really have to adopt that. Additionally, you can't, has anyone just kind of cringed when they're like, oh, I got to open my, my mobile banking app? Oh, I got to look at my statement, right? You have to, it's a very psychological thing, but you have to reframe your relationship with money. And it is a relationship. 
The way that you spin tells you so much about how you feel about yourself. And so when I'm working with women in leadership, that's a very frank conversation that we have. Some of the women that I work with are entrepreneurs. And again, they're bringing in seven figures in their business and living check to check. They are deeply uncomfortable with money, which reflects how they're able to navigate outside in the world. So isn't who's an entrepreneur here? Okay. When you made your first sale, and for those of you who maybe you made it to a friend, maybe you made it to someone in your community, have people asked you for, uh, is there any way I can get a discount? Uh, uh, is this, you know, oh, you've got it. it it'll be fine. So I've worked with uh, an atelier, and uh, they make bespoke wedding gowns. And again, this person has, you know, worked with, um, worked with entertainers, right? Uh, A-list entertainers, and has said, oh, I should give this person a discount. I said, oh, why? Or, Do you know them? No. Why are they getting a discount? Because they asked for one? Right, so you can't put yourself on sale. Similarly, when you are at work, what you are working for, the talent that you're bringing, you cannot discount. I look at certain banks, I think it was a BNP, where there was a, a sales team where the manager was taking the merit-based uh, bonuses and giving the merit-based bonuses earned by women and using it to boost men's salaries. That is not a legitimate business purpose, okay? So you really, really, really have to think about your contributions at work and ask yourself, again, why am I afraid to ask for this? What do I really think of myself and my talent? And go from there. Thank you. Um, and one of the other things that I would encourage, as she said, your relationship with money, being an entrepreneurship, please do not be afraid or ashamed to seek outside help and guidance. Your village won, but then also do. And I tell people, just like you go to the gym and you're focused on your physical health, do your mental health as well. You don't have to wait for a nervous breakdown to have a mental health coach or therapist because again, the stress that you're under, the pressure that you're under to really reach that high level of success, you have to mentally be healthy and strong as well. Create a team. I tell people I have Team Krishna. I didn't get here by myself. It took a village and it still takes a village for me to do what I'm doing. Some people have volunteered their time. Sometimes it's bartering services because you don't always have the money for staff and to do this and to do that. Figure out how you can barter, engage in conversations, be in rooms like this and connect with people. You would be amazed at how people are willing to help you and support you and help you to become successful and a better version of yourself. Because oftentimes our relationship with money have a lot to do with the way we were raised, what we've seen our parents do, and we take that mindset into our business and sometimes it does not belong there. It does not serve us. So think about those things. I know I have a little bit less than 10 minutes left. So I want to take five minutes or so and see if anyone had any questions. By all means, please raise your hand. Come on, come on up here to the mic. Let them hear you speak. I know she's like, oh, goodness, did she really just do that? Yes, please. <laughs> Hi, my name is Delvita Bannister and um, Brittany. You mentioned that um, in your journey, you were able to uh, provide a 16% growth in employee engagement. Employee engagement. 16% growth in revenue. In revenue. How, although the employee engagement was the highest for an organization. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. So um, I am a, a chapter president of an employee resource group at at and I'm the president. My co-vice uh, president's here. And, and right now, with a lot of the... Um, workers that are back in the office, employee engagement to be able to um, participate in our functions and our lunch and learns or any community events that we have is really low. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for any tips you have to help me to 
get the employees to get out of their seats away from their desks. I know, you know, job security is a thing that's on everybody's minds, but we want them looking for ways to get them engaged in at and initiatives mm -hmm. or, or whatever the um, assignments are, whatever the fun times are. So any tips you have? Yeah, so really quickly, I'll just say two things come to mind. Uh, and thank you for the question. The first thing is there's a trust problem there because you're back in office because leadership doesn't trust that people are getting things done at home, even though we know that people are working at home, right? Mm -hmm. So one is the question, as I understand it, is, well, how can we rebuild trust yeah. between leadership and the team. And, the team, the employees. and additionally, the question is also, what are you doing to provide value? Okay. Now, that looks different. You know, there are a lot of different things that are going on. I have a million more questions. <laughs> yeah. But um, how can you build value in a way that's of value to them? Okay. Not just a, you know, um, a pizza party. Nothing wrong with a pizza party. <laughs> but again, what's going to be compelling enough to make people say, you know what, I am going to walk away from my desk and I am okay. going to join in. So, okay. yeah. Okay. Mary Ann, what about you? Do you have any advice? So I'm an employer that likes my employees in the office, mm -hmm. right? I do, I do feel that um, I'm okay with hybrid, but I do think people need that camaraderie, that team spirit. I don't think you can, I don't think you, there's not a trust issue for me. I do like people to be tap each other on the shoulder, be able to talk to people. I think you lose all that continuity without people right. in the office, right? So I'm right. pro hybrid. Okay. Um, we do a lot of events where we invite our, our our people. As we have 50, so we have less to deal with. But right. we do invite them to different resource groups. We have women in technology every quarter, right? We, we do team coaching every quarter. The whole company is invited to come to that. We have a we have an event um, every June. Uh, we do Yankee games. We're doing hockey games with names like Rangers. Yeah, sorry, okay. I always forget those names. Basketball games. So we do different things for people right. to draw them in. Right. We do that. Yeah, so we do a lot to Are draw you people in. For those tickets? So, a yes, sometimes we do. Okay. Um, sometimes vendors co-sponsor, so it depends on what we're doing. Okay. Right. Okay. So any kind of partners that may buy through you, or you may support them, or buy through someone like <clears throat> me. Okay. Right. I would support some of your efforts. Okay. Good. Good <laughs> Stuff like know. that. So you get creative like that. Okay. Thank you. Sounds the good. other thing I would share with you is have the courage to ask your employees what do they want now. Because yeah. life has changed for us since coming back from the pandemic. Right. Right. And so, as Brittany mentioned, not everyone wants a pizza party. Right. And not every and there's nothing wrong with the sports tickets, but I have been in the company where they said, hey, give us your best effort. The top 10 people, you're going to get this wonderful surprise. And they gave me tickets to Camden Yards to see a baseball game. Let me add one thing, too, when you talk about that, because I'm a non-sports girl. So what okay. we started this year was... Special days of the month. Um, for for January, we, we support Everfree that um, supports human trafficking. So we do an event with human trafficking. Um, February, we did something else. April, my, my niece is autistic. We did an autism awareness event. So every month, we pick a special month. Um, this, this month was IT Professionals Day month, which is obvious for us. Mm -hmm. okay. But we pick different events a month. We give it a uh, photography month was, I think, March. Okay. So we give a gift card for the top three best social media photography posts. Okay. So little things to bring engagement up. Okay. Yes. Who don't and like so sports. I have, I'm going to take one more question. And then okay. just to... Well, we can do it at, because I have about five minutes. So I want to I wanna make sure I, I hear her question. Just... Tim, oh, okay, okay. So I want to get to your question. Would you go ahead, please ask your question. So thank you for the conversation today. Um, I know we're talking about um, breaking barriers, but also building the empires. Mm -hmm. As we're growing our businesses to build empires, what are some tips that you can give us in terms of succession planning to make sure that we are taking the knowledge and passing it on and building and helping those emerging leaders in your organizations? Yeah, so that's a good one. That's uh, that's a good one and a tough one all at the same time. And I think it's one of the areas as a small growing business we're challenged with, right? Because we don't have a large business where you have a lot of mentorship programs and strong processes. So we try, myself, my partner, Jason, we're trying to hire middle management leadership to help do that. But we spend a lot of time ourselves personally training and mentoring. And we're kind of in the weeds still, 
right? So they're looking for guidance from people like us who have 20, 25 years, right? There are women that work for me that are starting out in the technology space. They don't know how to build their brand. And that's kind of what we're there to do is kind of help them through that. It's much harder when you're smaller, right? But you have to, you give your time and attention to kind of mentor and train people. And we, we, we pair them up with other people that may be good for them, even if they're not in a leadership role, but they're an engineer looking to become a better engineer. So it's just pairing the right people together. And I think you you don't have to reinvent the wheel, mm-hmm. right? There are existing organizations that you can plug into. So immediately what I'm thinking of is um, Braven and what they do. They're a nonprofit. They focus on under-resourced uh, undergraduate students. Um, there are tons, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, et cetera, right? You can develop partnerships where you can immediately provide value that's only going to compound as your empire grows. And so it's important for you to think conceptually of your brand. Where do you want to be 20 years from now? Right? Let's do some design thing. How do we work backwards from that? What does that look like? And so I think um, really getting clear on what you want to accomplish. What are you really great at that you would love to share with someone else? Additionally, alumni groups. You didn't spend all that money for nothing, right? Um, And so there's more value than writing a check. Writing a check helps, but I can guarantee you that your alumni groups are looking for ways to connect people who are currently building their careers with people like yourself. So as you're dissecting kind of the anatomy of your legacy, thinking about to to the point that Delvita was, you know, asking before, how can you provide value. And especially if you're, you're building lean, you're like, listen, I can't, (laughs) I can't provide you with a check. Can you do an hour or two a week, an hour or two a month? And if you can working from there to figure out who can I partner with, who can I build a relationship with that can provide the framework by which I can deliver value. And when you're looking at your succession plan, think also about, as she said, your legacy For those of you who have the hope of being entrepreneurs, raise your hand. And do you have the hope of, you know, passing this down to my children? Count them out. (laughs) Count them out. Because they're going to, they're going to want to do their own thing. Like you may look up and there may be one who goes yes. But one of the challenges, my area of specialty, I've I'm the facilitator for Goldman Sachs, 10,000 small business with doing the HR portion. My air focus, when I talk about managing a multicultural, multi-generational workforce, is in regards to also how that looks with family businesses. The biggest struggle that there always is, is when you think that I'm go- th- my kid is going to do this. Look at, I, I've, I've left, I, I did this for you. And they're like, I didn't ask you to. <laughs> And they're telling you, and I've had parents go, Krishna, I've told them and my, my child doesn't want in. And I said, well, let them out. Get them out of the prison. For my, and I had to do the same thing for myself, have the honest conversation. I have a daughter who graduated from Princeton University. Brilliant. Has her own business. I have another one. Lord, we're going to all pray for that one. <laughs> the, the, then I have the youngest, and she wants to be an accountant. She's a numbers girl. I don't have an HR. So my succession plan, even for myself as the CEO, is how will I sell my business later on and then leave that legacy of money for my family? And are they then prepared to manage the money? It can be that as well, because sometimes we think we got to hold everything tight and it has to be mine, mine, mine forever. Maybe I built this for someone else to take it further than where I have. Krishna, I also saw Dr. T, forgive me, my, I saw you had a question as well. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Good afternoon, ladies. Thank you so much for your wisdom today. I, um, I'm Tanise Lewis. I'm a business coach and a speaker. And I hear you guys talking about your businesses and your leadership. And I know one of the most important things is your team. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I always tell clients is you don't go as far as your dream. You go as far as your team. And they always ask me about that. And so I just wanted your insight on some of the strategies that you use in building it. Because one of the things I talk to them about is like a framework that is it's a cop framework where you're building your core operational and your peripheral 
peripheral, people to help you cast the vision and see your blind spots. But how do you go about really building that in this day and age where people don't really want to work? Let's go down the line. <laughs> Mary, go ahead. Mary Ann, you go first. And yes, you're correct. A lot of them don't want to work anymore. <laughs> I think that's been the biggest challenge for us, I think. I think, you know, listen, we spent a lot of time working on the team, building the team, right? Teaching the team. And I think that when you look at the team that we have, right? If you look at myself, my partner, Jason, we were employees six years ago, right? So I think that helps them and encourages them that, listen, we're just two people that decided to quit a job and roll the dice and saw what would happen, right? So I think that helps motivate them and teaches them. And we try to make them feel like it's theirs also. And it's part of them, right? You know, we have to figure out, you know, what the future looks like and what happens later on. And, you know, we're always trying to continually give back to them, you know, whether it's a 401k finally or different things. But, you know, we spend a lot of time just kind of helping nurture them along and making them feel like they're bigging something building something bigger than themselves. You know, we work on airports, we work on bridges and tunnels, right? So we do a lot of, you know, cool stuff. And that makes them excited when they get to go on top of the GWB, right? And install a switch on the GWB. They take pictures of themselves up there. And that's motivating for them because they're doing something a little bit different. Excellent. I would say that, again, you you really have to understand people functionally. So I've, I've taught managing human behavior in organizations at Columbia. So I can, I'll talk to you about some strategies that I use. One of those is um, motivation. And Delvita, this may be applicable to you too. Most employees are motivated by one of three things. And I hate to break it to you, it's not money. Uh, it's power, affiliation, or achievement. Their ability, your ability to speak to that, to I correctly identify that is going to inform how you're able to build your team. And again, when you're an entrepreneur, that's your baby, right? It is very difficult to trust somebody who has significantly less of an investment in it. You know, they want to get paid and you may not know much else about them. So, Knowing that, also knowing it's going to take about 12 to 18 months for you to realize a return on your investment in their employment, it's a gamble. So when you're building that team, your interview process has to be incredibly well thought out. What are the questions that you're asking? What is the, additionally, what's the point of the exclusion? Why is this person not a great candidate? Is it something you just don't think you guys would get along? That to me is not sufficient. Uh, my question is, okay, why? But what is it about your organization? What is it about the value that you're providing to the market as a whole that attracted them? Money is not going to be sufficient. Money is not enough to make people work late. It's not enough for them to come into the office as opposed to finding a completely remote role. So there have to be... Uh, options. There has to be a framework for decision making that they can really, truly buy into. One of the things that I would like to re I remind leaders of um, that I've worked with when it comes to um, trying to attract and retain the best and brightest talent is that one, as we talked about earlier, tap into those resources, Girl Scouts, et cetera, um, colleges and universities, and even not just those, Think about the job you're trying to fill and is it something that you can train someone for? Can you, are you willing to train some, a, a woman, for example, who is in a domestic violence shelter and looking to create a career for herself? Are you willing to develop and groom them from, from scratch? And if so, do it. You would be amazed at when you tap into nonprofit organizations and those organizations that are making sure and um, trying to save the people in our communities, the loyalty that you gained from those employees, the commitment and drive because they said, when no one else gave me a chance, you did. And so that's one. Two, remember, everyone wants to be seen, heard, and valued. When you do that, your employees will be so committed to you because they know they matter. They know you care. And so when talking to candidates and trying to find the best candidate, like she said, those questions are key. Ask them why, not only why do they want to work, but what are their goals? 
And then you can start thinking about ways that how you can help them achieve their dreams and aspirations being in your business and be okay with the person who may only be there for a year or two. Not everyone is not meant to be a lifetime employee in your organization. It could be a blessing sometimes that they only stay a year or two and then their career progresses. And then when they're in this big time corporate, they go, I know someone who can do that. Let, let me let me go ahead and point you to them. Other times they're just not a good fit. And that's OK, too. Do not ta um, discount young professionals. You have some of the brightest young professionals in Gen Z and then millennials. But sometimes we go, I want someone with 30 years experience. Why? When the job only requires someone to just want to learn, who can adapt. You can teach the other stuff. But if you got the passion, the hustle, and the drive, you that you can't teach. And so I will take that all day long than I will someone with an elite education or all these years of experience. Because what I do requires passion and drive and determination. And I can't give you that. And so look for those gems as well, because they are truly the gems. They will be the gems in your organization is when you know that's what I need. Think about the cornerstone of what matters most to your business. I know we only have probably about a, a minute or a two left. I want to first of all let you know that we can continue the conversation. We will be, we said we will meet you. We will go where the exhibitor space is. I have a table. Doc, um, Brittany said she would sit next and be next to that table and you have a table in the exhibitor space. So please by all means come to us and talk to us there. We would love to continue the conversation. We just don't want to be a bottleneck for the next group that comes in here which is why we will shift in there. But if you need us, we're going to be around. You'll be here all day? Yeah. We'll, you'll be here? We're all here all day. But if you want to have further conversation, by all means, come and talk to us. We hope that you found this panel beneficial. Thank you. Thank you.